Netflix had just bought Animal Logic. And Animal Logic was screening the film for its employees on one Friday night. I couldn't go. Oh, then man. they said, oh, but we'll put on a screening for you, Ian, next week if you want. And I'm like, oh, yeah, whatever, as if you will. <laughs> and they totally did. Oh, but <laughs> it was with the head of Animal Logic, Zare Nalbandian. It was just me and Zare in the <laughs> Animal Logic theatre watching it. <laughs> And I don't That's think so I was. Awkward. Well, no, Zara is a really nice guy. Like, no, it was no, no. Really I great. mean, like, like just being alone and offer the screening just for you. Like, I know, I know. <laughs> welcome to the Visual Effects Notes podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by F Track. F Track Review is the all in one collaborative workspace where you and your team can give and receive interactive feedback on projects in real time. Forget endless email threads, comments on the wrong version, or constant video calls. F-Track Review replaces all of that with a seamless back and forth. Simply add your media, share your link, and you and your teammates and clients can review from anywhere in the world in real-time, frame-accurate sync. You can also scale up to full production management with F-Track Studio. Start your free trial today at ftrack.com. And now on to the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the VFX Notes podcast. I'm Ian Fales from Befores and Afters. And as always, I'm joined by Hugo Guerra. Hi, Hugo. Hey, Ian. How are you doing? How's everything going? Yeah, good. Thank you. I'm still down under. You're still in London. And here we are still online after all this time. I cannot <laughs> quite believe it. Well, we'll be together soon, though, like that. We'll, we'll, we'll join again. There will be a few, few surprises upcoming and like a few episodes which will be like with us uh, together. So I can't wait for that. <laughs> yeah. Hugo's talking about a rendezvous we'll be having at FMX and also in London. Um, but we won't reveal too much more about what we've got planned. Uh, you'll just have to stick to the VFX Notes podcast. Hugo, before we jump into today's episode, I want to make sure we're giving a shout out to a few people here. Firstly, our sponsors. Thank you so much for making the podcast possible. We really, really appreciate it. Also, our Patreon members. Um, for people who don't know, we make this podcast available early and ad-free to our Patreons, but we also list our Patreon members at the end of each episode on the video. Hugo, we really couldn't do this without our sponsors and Patreon members, could we? No, no, we couldn't. We can't thank them enough. Like, thank you so much for supporting the show. And also like everyone watching and everyone that's, that subscribes every week and leaves us lovely comments and both on Twitter and on YouTube. It's, it's great. Keep them coming. Keep engaging with us. Like I've we always try to answer everyone, and so if we don't answer you right away, just, you know, we, we'll get to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And also, if you've got any ideas for future shows, we're always open to uh, recording episodes about old films, old TV shows, and new ones as well. I mean, there's so much content around that we can barely keep up ourselves, but... Absolutely. You know, if there's something you want Hugo to analyze and break down the compositing for... Please send an idea. I'll just stay here and listen to Hugo, but <laughs> please send in your ideas. Well, today, Hugo, we're talking about a film that I'm going to say maybe wasn't on the Hugo and Ian radar originally, was it? No. And now so. it is. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, just won an Oscar. <laughs> so it's like, so I guess, I guess it's, no, it wasn't at all. No, it wasn't. I mean, I, I usually love these type of films. I usually love these type of animation films, but I'll be honest, like I was very late to it. I've only really only mm. watched it just now. And I guess we probably should tell the listeners, the audience who are, what are we talking about? <laughs> Hugo, obviously we are talking about the Netflix stop motion Pinocchio directed by Guillermo del Toro and Mark Gustafsson. Um, it did come out last year. It did just win the best animated film at the Academy Awards. Um, I've seen it twice and I'm sure I'll talk about my two very different kind of experiences, but I think you've only just watched it. Yeah. I just want, yeah, it's, it's funny. Like there's so, <laughs> we keep complaining, but we shouldn't complain. Like there's too much content. And I think that's just 
I I just couldn't take all of mm. it, especially when I go to Netflix. Netflix is so so full of stuff, and this is one of those films that I've bookmarked and I thought I'll watch it later. I mean, I like the Armando Toro a lot. Like, I'm sure I'm gonna like this. You know, I'm not not sure I really know Pinocchio at all. Like, I don't think so. I don't think I've watched. I don't think it's one of those stories that I watched when I was a kid. So I, I don't really have any connection to it um, at all. So yeah, just watched it just actually after it won the Oscar. Uh, so bad on me, <laughs> but <laughs> I guess uh, oh. watch it after everyone watched it already. So <laughs> no, but I think I think you might be that might be indicative of a lot of people's relationship with the film yeah. is that it won the Oscar and it's available freely, um, easily on Netflix. So therefore, people probably are catching it. I would say last year, sorta kinda it kind of felt a bit crowded in terms yeah. of releases, not just because of big films, but also there was another stop motion film on Netflix from um, Henry Selick called Wendelin Wilde. And of course there was another <laughs> Pinocchio, uh, the CG thought, uh, live action one from Robert Zemeckis, which look, isn't nearly as well. good as this film. <laughs> you watched that as well. <laughs> yes. I Well, <laughs> I'll be honest. I did not finish it. I I I did not manage to finish mm. it. Uh, but you know, um, yeah. Let's not talk about that film. <laughs> it is different. It yeah. is a different approach. I'll, I'll yeah, say that. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think it's interesting the way that yeah. was made, yeah. um, especially with some virtual production techniques. But this one, Hugo, I'll just tell you quickly about my experience watching it. I needed to do a whole bunch of interviews for the film. You know, pr prior to Christmas last year um, and prior to sort of the award season coming up for Pinocchio and every other visual effects and animated film, <laughs> Netflix had just bought Animal Logic and Animal Logic was screening the film for its employees on one Friday night. I couldn't go. Oh, then man. they said... Then they said, oh, but we'll put on a screening for you, Ian, next week if you want. And I'm like, oh, yeah, whatever, as if you will. <laughs> and they totally did. Oh but <laughs> it was with the head of Animal Logic, um, Zare Nelbandian. And I got back that morning from a trip to, um, I think I was at the VIEW conference, actually. So it was like October, November. So I was so tired. It was just me and Zari in the Animalogic Theatre watching it. And I don't That's think so I was... Well, no, Zari's a really nice guy. Like, no, it was no, no, really no. I great. mean, like, like, just being alone and offer the screening just for you. Like, I know, I, know. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was great to see it because it really helped with the interviews. However, I reckon I wasn't prepared for the film. Now, what I mean by that is... I didn't really realize where Del Toro and the filmmakers had gone with this, you know, which is the setting, which is the war torn stuff, which is the very, I don't know, a, a very different approach to Pinocchio. But also I wasn't ready for the musical side of it. Yeah. I don't think Netflix had really pushed, push, push, you know, that there was singing and music in this as much as, 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 as there is. All that meant was my first experience was that I'm not sure I was totally taken by it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so great to see it. And then I covered it in depth and we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Cut to January 2023. I'm in Los Angeles for the Bake Off. And there's a week of amazing screenings over in Los Angeles because it's award season. This film gets screened at the Academy museum this brand new museum huge cinema with a q a with guillermo mark and some of the other production team for some reason i have a totally different perspective on the film watching it the second time and actually i loved it i really the story really absorbed me um and i just it just it reminds me of a bunch of films we've talked about on the vfx notes podcast like eternals and like so many more, when we see it a second time, we see something different. So I just thought I'd tell those stories about how, you know, sometimes your perspective can change after a second viewing. Yeah, it definitely does. Like that happens quite a few times to me. And also not just the second viewing, but 
Probably yeah. it happens to you as well. Like sometimes you watch something years later and it's a completely different experience either from your experience in your life or other things you've watched before or even appreciation of things that you didn't appreciate at the time. So I definitely understand what you mean. Um, having said that, um, <laughs> I, I struggled with the film. I I know I know this is not a popular um, a view. I didn't like the film. I'll just say it out there. You can start typing the comments on YouTube. That's fine. I know it's not very popular, this idea. The film has like 90-something on Rotten Tomatoes. Almost hmm. categorically, everyone loves it. I think I think my problem with the film, no, no, no disrespect to everyone that worked on it. The film is beautiful. The film we're gonna talk extensively about the visual effects and about the the DOP and about like all the workmen that is there and all the amazing stop motion animation that is there. The film just didn't grab me at all. It was really quite a struggle for me to watch it. And I think it I think it's just a personal thing. I I really, really hate singing movies. I hate them. Like I just Dude. cannot stand when they start talking and singing, it just switch, switches me off. And I, and for me, musicals is just like a no-go. Like I, I, as soon as I, I hear someone start singing, I either switch the channel or I switch to another movie. I just can't stand this oh, idea of people go. just start singing <laughs> out of the blue for no for no obvious reason. I just like, why are they singing? What, what, sorry, why are they singing? Like, why are they just singing? Obviously, I understand this is a a children's film which is an, it isn't a children's film but it is a children's mm -hmm. it's very very conflicting for me like it it tries to be a children's film but it's also not a children's film because of all of the fascist dictatorship mm -hmm. background that it has from 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 spain from italy and i i kind of like i really struggled so that was struggle number one the the music struggle number two for me Maybe it's because I'm not so used to international movies because I've been watching international movies for decades now. I can't understand why the film is not in Italian. I'm sorry. I, I, I can't go past mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. And there's no, Italian, there's no Italian version on Netflix. There's only like a few languages. And for me, it really bo bothers me that there are people with pure English accents and people with pure American accents and then people pretending to have Italian accents. And then sometimes you have Italian being spoken on the film. And I'm like, it just takes me out of the experience. It's just like Ridley Scott's <laughs> House Gucci. Like, I was all keen to watch the film. And then they all speak English with an Italian accent. What the hell? Like, I, I, I thought we were past this. Especially Netflix. Netflix has an, an amazing platter of, of, of Spanish and Italian and German. And it has all sorts of... It's like the world coming together in Netflix. I love Netflix for that. I love the mm. fact that they have shows from all over the world things that we would never be able to see if we didn't have Netflix and why is it in it why is it not in Italian I, I just those two things really bother me I mean and, and I, I could, we, yeah. we all know the answer to that and that's I, the I accessibility know, but yeah that, that's a fair point Hugo I I would takes say me out. it just takes me out out of yeah. the film you know like but there's more things like that I didn't like like but but you you go, go ahead, ahead. I'll, I'll, no no you go a few more and then I'll go <laughs> with a few more again <laughs> <laughs> I have a list here. <laughs> I, I think I think one thing you brought up, which is fascinating, is that who is it for? Yeah. And I'm not sure I know any children who have seen it um, yeah. in terms of my friend's kids um, and whether they'd want to see it or if their parents would let them see it. I'm not sure what the rating is here in Australia, the classification. But... but you know, that's part of Del Toro's thing, which is that animation isn't just for children. And of yeah. course, I don't think it's just for, animation should be just for children at all. In fact, I'm kind of up opposite to you there. And I'm super glad that there's an adult made animation. Yeah. Right. Which, which is diametrically opposed to the Disney Pinocchio from, from the old days, but also the Zemeckis one. I mean, all of that is deliberate, right? Like, it's yeah. absolutely deliberate. Yeah. But, but having said that, there's a bit of a challenge in the film, which is that sometimes it feels kiddie, yeah. you know, compared to the fascism stuff. And it's true. You, 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 you watch the film and maybe there are a few different tones going on. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think most people including me, when you watch it at least a second time, 
you end up being taken by yep. the stop motion and, and the visual effects, which we'll talk about. Yeah, that you almost get distracted by that and the story is almost not as important, yeah. which may well be a problem. But tell me about some of your other issues with it, Hugo. I, I, I think I it's th- worth talking about. I think it's about that, actually, about what you just mentioned. Um, I, I definitely think the stop motion element of it in the behind the scenes or 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 very powerful and it, it makes your viewing completely different. I haven't watched the second time because... I'm sorry, can't do it. But but I I did watch multiple sections of it again, you know, because of this mm. podcast. I went back and watched multiple parts and skipped the music and just like kept watching the middle sections without the music. Because sometimes there's even like two music acts right back to back, and I'm like, ah, oh, again, he's gonna sing again. But anyway, the 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 thing with this can is I the, just say yeah. I actually <laughs> the second time found those delightful, and I thought they worked. But keep going, sorry, Hugo, keep going. <laughs> uh, there's also another problem for me. Like I feel, and again, no disrespect to any animation uh, uh, animator on this film. I think the film is a bit distracting. It's too, I, I know this is ridiculous, but to say, and who am I to say this? But I felt the film sometimes was over animated. I felt the film was a bit too distracting. And the fact of that is that for me, it felt a bit like that because there was not only the gorgeous animation going around, which was very detailed, sometimes too detailed, but also the camera moves that are moving way too much for an animation movie. And I, I feel like it really sometimes took me off because there was so much going on. And I, and, and this is not just Guillermo del Toro's films. I have a, an issue sometimes with regular other CG animation films. Um, it's funny that I'm saying regular. It's just because it's more common now to see CG animation than anything mm. else. But mm. when you look at normal, like regular CG animation, I also feel that it's over animated. And I feel that they 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 do too many movements. They're like moving all the way around, and it it almost like it's schizophrenic in terms of movement. And I and and I I do really love when you look back and you look at, of course, you know, if you go look at Ghibli Studios and the way that the animation is so fluid, but also so small and only happens sometimes. I'm I'm sure you know Japanese animation is very much like that. But when you look back also at stop motion. If you look at Wallace and Gromit uh, series, and also if you look even at Wes Anderson's films, the camera is sometimes more static, and also the the animation is more insightful. Like the animation is more like it happens for a purpose, and then it stops, and then it happens again, and then it stops. I felt that this film was way too much. It was over the top. Everything was moving on the screen, and it makes it for a hard watch. And then together with the fact I watched it on a projector on 4K, it's even sharper and it's it's like just a bit too much. And because of that, I don't feel it has the same charm that for me has when I watch Wallace and Gromit or when I watch, uh, you know, Fantastic, Fantastic Mr. Fox, which, by the way, some of the people who worked on this project worked on those projects. So it's, it's like, yeah. it's funny how, it's funny how one director and one vision really... Ch- changes the whole entire approach to a film because because a lot of these people a lot of these amazing artists have worked on all the films that I've just mentioned um, yeah. and so so and then of course you already mentioned the war thing and the fascist re- I have, was not expecting the fascist regime to show up and Mussolini even to be a part of, I'm sorry spoilers Mussolini shows up on this film <laughs> really tiny Mussolini uh, and and I, I I find that that was also really strange like suddenly like we were on a horror uh, on a horror almost war film. And I understand it's a very Guillermo del Toro thing to do, uh, but I, I, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I think at this time, probably people listening can just realize that this is that's just not for me. I, there's something that doesn't touch me completely, yeah. but I, I, I think the, 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 the workmanship, like the work that is in display, the animation that is on display, is magnificent, and the work is beautiful. But I think. And I think the too much animation thing comment that I've made, I have a I have a feeling that I think I know why because you know Guillermo del Toro talks a lot about that on the behind the scenes, which people should go and watch. Like there's an amazing mm. documentary on Netflix itself and on YouTube as well, thirty minutes long for the whole production, which is really good. Um, he talks a, a bit about this on the behind the scenes where he explains that he gave free range for the animators to actually be the actors on the film. And so that means each of the 
characters and each of the animators were basically kind of kept, they were a bit alone by themselves animating that character, which is, which is logical because it's almost like an actor. The actor has its own performance that he's doing and he's bringing something into the character and he's bringing something to the script. But I felt that that also kind of didn't help to watch a cohesive animation because I felt that some characters were over-animated, others weren't, and the whole thing was a bit unbalanced and everyone was very different. And, and for example, give an example, the last thing I'll say, the Pinocchio thing, Pinocchio himself was a bit annoying. I, I just like felt that he was moving too much, he was rotating too much, he was so schizophrenic that I was almost having a heart attack watching him. And that kid's voice, oh, I, 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 okay. All right, like, okay, anyway, that'll I, do. I, that will do. That'll like, do. I don't. I really want to say to everyone. I think this is a me problem. I think it's my problem. I don't think the film is bad in any way. The film is amazing. It's loved by everyone. It just didn't touch me as deeply as I guess most people did. And uh, you, and you, you know, you, and, and I, that's it. <laughs> th that's how you feel, which is yeah. totally fine. You could you could argue with the over animation thing that it's actually a response from the directors to arty stop motion yeah that and and 2d animation that's a bit subtle on purpose yeah you know long shots where we're pondering things they're kind of trying here to make more of a live action thing where actually if you watch a live action film some actors do move around a lot yeah and I perform know. naturally and others other live action films can be quite subtle too of yeah. course and yeah. animated films I don't think, I think I noticed the intense animation, you know, like there's, there's lots of vignettes of animation, you know, like how they'll touch tables or knock things off or get, you know, like uh, they're on, uh, Papa is on the ladder in the church and that seems like very heavily animated um, in the painting scene. But I think... They're trying to communicate a world, you know, um, and they do they do a really good job of it. You do feel like you're in this grungy, hard world, you know, war torn world yeah. at some point. Um, you do feel which characters are evil, which ones are good. Sometimes in these animated films that are maybe leaned more towards younger audiences. You don't like they those things are sort of spelt out for you. Yeah. Here the world building spells it out for you. Um so I I know what you mean, Hugo, but I wonder whether sometimes, just like any director's vision, it's all part of what he was trying to do. No, it probably as a is, response. Yeah. As a response yeah. to what's out there. Yeah, no, I'm I'm um, sure it is. I'm sure it is. Hugo, you mentioned the behind the scenes for this film. And look I've got to say, if you're an animation aficionado or stop motion expert or just someone who likes that stuff, the behind the scenes for this film is off the charts. <laughs> yeah. There's that 30 minute doco you mentioned, which you can get on YouTube or Netflix. There's a bunch of little featurettes that Netflix released. One of the most amazing things is the animators and other artists on the film who regularly, you know, post about the film on yep. Instagram or Twitter have the most insightful observations about specific shots. I mean, that's a very exciting thing about this film. Because it was pushed, pushed, pushed for awards, there's also tons of articles. I'm one of those people that did heaps of articles. The latest <laughs> issue of Befores and Afters, this sounds like a plug, but really I'm just saying, you know, there's tons of coverage of the film. Um... I did a whole issue on animation, basically. <laughs> You've got it too. Nice one. <laughs> it's really good, by the way. I, this yeah. is not Ian saying, you should go and buy Before and Afters magazine. This is really good issue. This is a really good issue. I, I yeah, almost like what? Half of it is about uh, Pinocchio. So Yeah, I, because I spoke to four different sets of filmmakers about the work, I figured it'd be nice to be in a bit of a book, a magazine form. You know, funnily enough, the art of book is available online 
um, yep. to browse through. Part yep. that's partly yep. because of award season. Yeah. They did a billion Q and A's. Del Toro was out there really promoting the film, and look, so they should. It's years of work. Um, yeah, and, five years. You know, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's yeah. the other thing about these stop motion films and animated films. They take so long. Um, the the filmmakers have also had a chance to present on the film. Another plug is that Georgina Haynes, the puppet fabrication supervisor, who's in my magazine article, um, she's presenting in my Then and Now track at FMX, and she's actually bringing some of the puppets along, made by her team and McKinnon Saunders, for you to basically take photos of and be in your Instagram, which is, (laughs) I'm really excited about that. So what I mean is there's a lot of a, there's a lot of discourse about the film. Now, here's what I also think about that in a good way and a bad way. Ever since Leica started publishing and maybe Ardman as well, a lot of their time lapse behind the scenes of an animator doing the stop motion because you know it takes all day to do half a second of animation or all week to do seven seconds of animation or whatever it is ever since they tend to publish that either as promotional material or sometimes it's even over the credits of the film which is actually really cool i think that has just become this amazing marketing thing possibly to the point where people get so excited about the behind the scenes they're almost more excited about the behind the scenes than the film do you kind of know what I mean by that, Hugo? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do. Like, like <laughs> I'll be very honest. Like, I loved the behind the scenes so much more than the film. Well, and, I thought and you I, might I, be that person. I'm yeah. so sorry to say that, but I, I think the watching these time lapses is, is magnificent. Mm. Also, watching all of the amazing how they've made some of the things you know with the props and also the the wires and also the the way that they've gripped the objects and the way that they've split the animation so that they then comp them together we'll talk about that in a minute but there's an enormous amount of visual effects in this film although Mm. although it kind of like might not seem like there is any vfx but there is so much vfx on this film and you see that on the behind the scenes when you see that most of it is on green screen really yeah um so so i I think the behind the scenes are just beautiful. The, those, I, I really think it really spoils the the production. It it does if you think about it. Like I, it does because you're kind of like wanting to see that magical side of it. And yeah, I I, I Wallace and Gromit never really had a lot of that. And I I think it's because it's another time. It's because they back then maybe they didn't film or photograph as much as they do now these days. But ever since, you know, Wes Anderson has been doing the animations and also like, like you said, like, it's just been happening more and more often. And yeah. they're just like beautiful pieces of work. Even, Matt, even scrolling through your magazine and watching the photos or even on your website, when you watch your articles on the website itself on Before and Afters, and you watch these beautiful photos of the puppets and the beautiful photos of all the mouths. In fact, I have that on my screen here. Look like that. Uh, all yeah, the wow. mouths and all the heads. That's Those the are 3D just, printed that, ones. Yeah. That's just fascinating to watch. Mm. It's fascinating mm. to watch these photos and this behind the scenes. And it's really good that we watch it because, you know, we've talked a lot about on this uh, uh, podcast where sometimes they try to hide how it was done. And, um, you know, talking, of course, about Top Gun mostly. But I feel like on animation, especially on stop motion, they don't hide it at all because fortunately for them, uh, talking about animation and talking about things that are done by hand is a romantic affair. Like people are Mm. so romanticized by this that they love, oh my God, they did it by hand. All of it is by hand. Sometimes I wish that there was so much care like this also given to 3D and to CG because I also see a world where we could have amazing behind the scenes watching also time lapses of CG and time lapses of modeling like we used to, like we used well, to have that. You yeah. Know? Okay. And, yeah. That, I'm so glad you brought that up. Okay. Okay. Well, you go, we could talk about this for two hours. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> that's <Strap> also, <laughs> that's also one of my points is that, As we often talk about with the practical effects versus CG thing, 
there is something about an audience's feeling towards tangible effects, i.e. tangible stop motion puppets, right? Even though we know there's lots of visual effects in the film. Yeah. And so those making ofs, the time lapses and the under the armature sort of photos and videos, that's very much about appealing to the audience who loves the handcraftedness of it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Now, what's curious about that is there's an argument, well, there's two things here to talk about. There's an argument that maybe Leica films, which are absolutely handcrafted, amazing puppets, um, you know, stop motion they have become a little bit more edging towards the CG side yep. and look and feel as well, not just side, but look and feel because they actually do have a lot of CG characters in there and they tend to smooth out the seams and the edges. Here, it does feel like the directors kept it a bit messy. I'm not sure if I could see any fingerprints in any of the characters or anything yep. like that but it did feel a bit more old school. Um, yeah. Did yeah, you feel yeah. like that? I guess I'll just ask you about that first. I, I, yes, I did. I did. But it, it is it is fascinating that, I mean, on this film, they, like, you saw even on the, uh, on the on your article on your book, like on the interview you had with the VFX supervisor, you kind of see that he was actually strapping in for that. He was like, okay, we're going to scan everything because they mm. might ask to do a full CG replacement. Yeah. They might ask to replace the whole thing. And they kept their guns. Like, apparently they didn't. Uh, I hope it's true. Like, and apparently they didn't. I, I don't believe anything anymore. But uh, but I, I apparently they just left it as it was, as it would for, as it was photographed, just like an old school uh, motion control based uh, stop motion animation. Obviously, they used compositing to a huge degree to remove all the wires and all the rods because. The thing with this film is that this film is different from all the other films. There's so much movement and so much camera movement and also so many jumping around and flying around with the characters that it it is different. It is completely different from the making of other types of stop motion animation. So so yeah, it definitely definitely felt very much alive. It felt like mm. they were really photographing something for real. And I, and going back to your behind the scenes thing, I definitely think people really attach themselves to that. People yeah. love that. But I, I'll just keep keep hammering this idea. Maybe someone will start doing it. I do think that there is also a space for this to happen in CG. And in fact, like I, I I've experimented this a few times, even on my little small projects. I've posted mm-hmm. multiple times on my YouTube channel uh, uh, time lapses of my compositing and CG work, and man, they're the my biggest videos on YouTube. Yeah. Like, like uh, one of them has like all, almost 100,000 views. Like, and I, I'm kind of like, there's definitely an audience for it. And there's definitely people wanting to watch that and how it was done. Yeah. And I just don't think they give it a chance. It kind of really reminds me of the old school DVDs. Like, you know, like if you look back, for example, at the, the special edition of Perfect Storm, if you look at, which I'm plugging as well, that we are having an episode about it on the, the <laughs> podcast, but on Perfect Storm's uh, Blu-ray and, and DVD, you have a ton of breakdowns and a mm. ton of really, really detailed breakdowns and detailed screen grabs and screen recordings of yeah. the softwares themselves and the actual animation grids and the actual, just the software, even even the supervisor next to the computer talking about it. We used to do this. We used to do this, and people loved it. And yeah. somehow it went out of fashion. Well, okay. And I, I hope we can go back to having it again. Well, I agree with you. And guess what? I've got one for you. <laughs> okay. Good. Blender Studio, which is the studio that makes a bunch of these Blender open films, just released a new short film called Charge. And guess what? The end credits have time lapses oh, of the cool. modeling and that's UI cool. and Blender interface. That's amazing. That's amazing. And it's awesome. And actually, it's highly engaging. And I just did a podcast with the director um, where we talked about that. And I said, gosh, I wish, I don't think it's going to happen, but I wish Pixar and DreamWorks yeah. and Animal Logic did this. Of course, they would probably feel like they're, um, you know, real. Uh, 
showing too much behind the curtain. Yeah. But actually, people would love it and it would expose to audiences how much work goes into it. And we so, see it sometimes, you know, like when we go to festivals, if we go to VIEW or if you go to FMX or SIGGRAPH mm. and behind closed doors, we sometimes see the recording screens of uh, like sure. they sometimes post on their keynotes the full recording time lapse of something happening or being modeled or being this. Of course, with a warning, do not take photos before. But I, I feel like there is a world where we could like that that documentary from Netflix going back and trying to go back to Pinocchio now, like that documentary on Netflix could definitely happen as well for other films in CG, and it doesn't. And and most of the times when I watch behind the scenes of Pixar movies, it's like the actress feeling this and how it was on the booth recording, and oh my God, I love recording on the audio like this, and then they did amazing things, <laughs> and then it that's it. And it's like... like it's, yeah. it's skipped completely. It's completely skipped, the whole thing. And I know it's a bit geeky, and I know it's a bit technical, but there is an audience for it. And also, not only there is an audience, but there is definitely a way of presenting it mm. in a way that the regular audience could also watch it. I definitely well, think there is I a mean, way. Yeah, I'm taking it one step further, and I'm suggesting they do it in the closing credits, like yeah. Leica does, and yeah. Pinocchio could have... But Hugo, I will shout out one more studio that does do a good job of showcasing their work right now, and that's Walt Disney um, Animation Studios. Yeah. If you go to their website, they have awesome breakdowns and websites and links and links and links to the process. Part of that, I feel, might be a bit of a recruitment exercise about, you know, Could hey, <laughs> what, is a, what does a concept artist do? What does an animator do? What does a groom artist do? But it's very surprising to go there and see the process for Encanto or, you know, all the other films. So shout out to Walt Disney, Disney Animation, for doing that. I would love more studios to do that, and I'd love it to happen in the credits. So, Hugo, we're here to make a change, right? We're here to <laughs> push that. We should start yeah. a hashtag. Uh, what should I'll we only, do? I'll only be happy when I see breakdowns of Top Gun. That's when I'm going to be happy. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's um let's segue a little bit to the actual production on Pinocchio. Yeah. And I mean, as we say, please go away and watch some of these breakdowns and uh, documentaries about the film. I, I will just highlight, Hugo, that you mentioned the five year thing. But not only that, it's a tale of making of a film across two continents, yep. England and USA. Oh, I should well three countries really because mexico got involved as well yeah um one of the most fascinating things from my point of view is that somehow over the last 20 years portland oregon became the epicenter of stop motion animation and of course that's partly because of Leica. at the time this film was being made i think there were at least three huge productions going on in portland which is pinocchio wendell and wilde and Leica's upcoming film, how they managed that process and got animators and had space and found MoCo cameras and, you know, all the different things that have to happen surprises me to this day how they did it. But that's a fascinating thing about, you know, it's like saying that Sydney becomes the center of, I don't know, visual effects or something. But Portland basically um, has this talent and that's where the main production was. But also puppet fabrication occurred as well at a really amazing place called McKinnon and Saunders and in Portland. Yeah. Um, and then Mexico had this amazing kind of extra um, contribution to the film um, as well. And of course, Del Toro is from that country. So yeah, yeah. it's uh, nice Tala to see del, different Tala, places. Yeah, Tala de Shusho. Yeah, I... I I, I thought that was brilliant as well. It was really beautiful of him bringing uh, his country into mm. this production as well, and to actually like you know go back to his roots and also like like give work to these to the because I'm sh I'm sure that after COVID there was every company was like quite uh, quite keen to have more work. So yeah. so yeah, no this this was really coming together of a lot of different studios and 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 it's it's amazing to see on that front. But it's, I mean. What can we say? It's just fascinating. I could watch these photos and these behind the scenes forever. The way that they have make these puppets, it's just they're basically sculptures. And not only like they are, 
incredibly well designed and beautiful, but they're so complex with mm. paddles, paddles inside the faces and completely 3D rigs behind. It's almost watching a real Maya 3D rig for real, you know, like like in yeah. live view, you're watching the entire rig, um, you know, which is, well, I I'm, I'm, should say that I'm, obviously it's the other way around, like Maya's pretending to be those rigs because that's where it started. <laughs> but it, it's it's funny... It's funny how you watch the production process of this, which is yeah. also very... Also, there's a lot of the production on this, which was really uh, revolutionary as well. The way that you use the paddles inside the face. They didn't have to replace all the faces because normally they replace the parts and put them back, like the mouths and the eyes and everything. They did that for Pinocchio itself, but for the other characters, they didn't. Yeah. So there was also like a lot of revolutionizing uh, animation, stop-motion animation on that side, on that well, front. Well, you could... Yeah, or, or you could say... That's going back to how it was done before 3D printed replacement yeah, exactly. faces. Because yeah, yeah. let's just explain that for a minute. I, this has been around for a while in the stop motion industry. Leica has really pushed, 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 pushed ahead with this rapid prototyping, right? You've got a character. You design it in 3D first. You then print out 100 heads and 100 mouths. And they're actually the different face shapes that are required. And each time you need to replace a face shape or a piece of face, you literally replace it. Sometimes it means that you just replace half the face and there's a seam, which is often in Leica films, removed. So that is a very common way, and it's how Pinocchio was done, um, to do rapid prototyping, 3D printing and replacement animation. They did that for Pinocchio himself here, but for the other characters, which maybe Del Toro and the directors, they wanted to go for a different look and feel, say for um, Papa, where actually it's mechanical faces. Yeah. Operate, you know, with, as you say, Hugo, amazing pieces of clockwork inside the yeah. puppets, sometimes animated with like Allen keys turning yeah. little and sometimes pieces pencils are like with little oh pencils moving around the oh eyes just one little note about uh, the prototyping and the 3d printing about the 3000 <laughs> faces that pinocchio was printed <laughs> yeah there are 3000 of them yeah, uh, not 100 3000 yeah <laughs> i'll be putting a few photos uh, uh, while we're watching yeah, there, well, there's 800 smiling faces nine dead faces 50 yelling faces 3000 in total it's it's bonkers it is insane I, I'm I'm hoping they gave away one per person that worked on the project. They could have it as a souvenir. <laughs> um, but anyway, going back to this fascinating thing as well that people might might not realize is that the the way that CG and visual effects and prototyping and sculpting is kind of so intertwined on this yeah. production because obviously for you to 3d print something you need to model it and so you, they went in and 3d modeled these faces and actually i guess animated them in 3d because they had to have the mouth to and get they had the to shapes have, yeah to get the whole shape so it's like it's really funny it's like animating something in 3d uh Boshing it out on ZBrush. I think it was. I think it was ZBrush. I think I saw ZBrush on some of the screens. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it wasn't ZBrush, but I think it was. But anyway, you bash it out in 3D sculpting. You animate it. You do all the faces. Then you go in 3D print what you just modeled in CG. Another fascinating merging of practical and digital here. And I felt that this is like really using the most you know, the most futuristic pipelines you can find to do the most old school thing you can think of. It's yes. it's uh, it's beautiful to think... You remember those behind the scenes about Jurassic Park where you had uh, Phil Tippett like doing the stop motion animation version of, of Jurassic Park and then that was kind of scrapped because the CG was so good? Imagine a world where we had this method, where we had CG prototyping and then merging with the CG like it is fascinating to see that it's almost like it's going full circle we're going well, back to the stop motion well, but also having the CG together and it's it's uh, can't wait to see what happens next you know like well, it's, it's I think really you're cool. describing what Leica does which <laughs> I know, I know is, yeah. it comes in for criticism sometimes because you're not quite sure if this central character was achieved with stop motion or with CG 
yeah. because it's just a little bit too smooth. But I mean, I don't think that about every like a film or character. It's just yeah. occasionally that's what happens. But that is one of the efficiencies. You know, you're modeling these characters and then, you know, you're printing them, but then you also have a super accurate model that yeah. could be the CG, which can be further enhanced by photogrammetry and normal scanning, you know, um, because which, which you want be that on- tangible look as well, right? So yeah. yeah, which to be honest, like Hardman, for example, has done this a few times where you had, you know, you saw the Pirates movie. What was the name of the film? The Pirates movie that they made, which was yeah. all done in CG. There have been a few attempts where CG was trying to replicate stop motion. Well, the Pirates wasn't all CG. You might be thinking of um, oh, sorry, Flushed I'm, Away. Could, yes, ex- I'm so sorry. Yes, I'm so sorry. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Flash Away was that one. Um, and it's funny how some studios are trying to mimic the stop motion and doing it in the city. And there's, I guess there's an argument here where we've, we all know that we've reached the phase in CG where we could do this Pinocchio film in CG, and it would probably look just as real as it does now. I, we know that. Like, like shaders and lighting and rendering techniques have reached the point where you could probably mm. introduce all those imperfections. You could introduce all those, those fingerprinting. All that imperfection could be introduced into it because we've seen it in a few productions, even some films, where we've seen v- major imperfections being introduced to a film. Obviously, that was not the decision being made on this film, but that there is an argument where maybe that's the future. Because, I mean, if you look back at the production of this film, I mean, Jesus, printing 3,000 faces and doing it all by hand, it is like a very, very arduous project to do because every time you switch a face it moves slightly and then you have to either try to fix it in the shoot or have to comp it and and then tweak it and composting with warping and moving it around there there is so much work that has to happen because of the fact that they actually shot it for real and um, so it's 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 fascinating to see where this goes and i i understand what you mean i've seen the criticisms for like i i think like it has something there i think that they are merging everything and trying to come up with something. They're, they're trying, and I'm sure it will arrive to some destination, which will be a hybrid of multiple things. And I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm completely okay with having a hybrid. I don't really care if it's all done in stop motion or all not done in stop motion. As long as it's an engaging story, as long as it's a beautiful film to watch, I mean, who cares if it was really photographed or half of it photographed or or a piece of it photographed and then merged to another piece. Like, it's all artistry and it's all filmmaking. And I think sometimes, sometimes I think some directors and some filmmakers get attached too much to certain things and they should just choose whatever is easiest to do a project. A little bit like, a little bit like Christopher Nolan does usually is a M- MO, you know, like we try to shoot it for real. If we can't, we'll do it in CG. And I think that's that's a good approach. And on this film, you can kind of see that some things could have been done in CG, sometimes could have been could have been done in 2D. Obviously the decision was made to be done all in 2D, but not quite. I mean, there's so much CG on it as well. Like I mean I I, yeah. I feel like I feel like there's an impression that this film has no CG, isn't it? Like there is an impression. What well, yeah, just film. before? Yeah, I, well, I don't know. I, <laughs> just before we get to that, I just want to bring up something that you mentioned, which was, um, you know, all the work that goes into it and then fixing it. I felt like on this film they didn't always fix it. If it didn't yeah. quite line up, if it was a bit hokey. They left I'm it. sure if it was really hokey, they would fix it. But generally, you know, you, they wanted to feel like the people had their hands on the puppets. Yeah. And um, part of that tangibleness comes from the fact that the puppets are often supported by, um, you know, stands and things like that, which are removed in visual effects. But it kind of brings in that imperfection. Um, and it wasn't imperfect. It wasn't like plasticine with the thumbprints on it that maybe we used to see from the original Ardman animations um, or even, you know, um, Harryhausen days. But I think they were going for, Hugo, that sort of, we did touch this with our hands. And that's the only thing I'm comparing to Leica, which is Leica is 
we did use stop motion, but you don't really know how we did it. And that's, I actually that's, I agree with you. That's totally cool too. But yeah. it's just not tapping into that audience yeah. feel. But this but is you, where the visual effects comes in. But and be- you're right. Before, but before you go to that, one little thing <laughs> I need to mention what you said. I actually have a bit of a little issue with um, with Pinocchio itself, and, and that was kind of took me out a bit when I was watching. I understand why they did it. They 3D printed it, 3,000 faces. It, that's the only way to go because you couldn't really make his mouth. It had to be like a chisel, almost open mouth thing going on, which was beautiful. It's a really good design. Mm. But I felt that he doesn't look like wood. A lot of times on the film, it doesn't look like he's made of wood. And I, I wish that it looked more like wood. He was too perfect and he was too 3D printed. I'm sorry, he was. like I felt like he was not... Uh, rough enough, especially f- considering a drunk man has made him. Like he was drunk, the guy. He, he was completely drunk, out of his like his his mind when he was doing it. So I, I feel like when you look at the other characters, which are real cloth, and you know you, the, the the faces are made of latex, and the whole thing is like you see the real clothing, and everything has this patina of 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 stop motion reality, but then kind of turns me off when I look at Pinocchio himself. I, I feel like he's too perfect, and I feel like there's like there's definitely the um, a choice here, a creative choice, that, that I feel like could have been a bit less 3D printed, could have been a bit more organic, I feel. Uh, but, you know, like, that's just me. That's just my, like, when I look at it, you know. <laughs> well, I think an interesting thing is about performance. Yeah. You know, Pinocchio had to, you might not have liked it, but Pinocchio had to bend and twist and wobble and all this sort of thing. And that might not be the reason that they went with a 3D printed um, approach to Pinocchio. Um, Because 3D printing also means basically colorizing it. You know, you don't paint 3000 heads, you 3D print them in color. Yeah, Um, yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I think. I think it was a stylized thing. Um, I think it worked because part of it is uh, you're already buying that you're watching like a, a, a life, a puppet that's come to life, right? So I think if you didn't buy into it, Hugo, as you didn't seem to, no, you're not going to buy into no. any of the characters. No. <laughs> It's very obvious that, that people can understand that I didn't really like it. But, I, but I, hey, I'm making my point. I'm having my reasons, and I'm sure I'm happy mm. for people to debate them on YouTube with me. But I have posted my reasons, and I've made my points, and they're all reasonable points. Come on, debate me then. <laughs> Everyone is free to debate me on YouTube. I'm happy. I'm happy for this to be just like... The last episode we had something like this was in Dune, where I also mentioned that I didn't like the film that much, and and I, yeah, it was uh, it was it was uh, I had some some not so gracious comments on YouTube. I'm sure I'll have a few of those like here as well. But uh, keep it keep it uh, keep it clean, everyone, <laughs> and <laughs> don't be too harsh and try to try to conversate t- talk with me about this. Yeah. Or maybe I'll be surprised. Maybe I'll find out that more yeah. people thought about it. But anyway, segue to the me, effects. As no, you no, 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 okay, no, yeah. no. Now that we're <laughs> really getting into the weeds, I think, I think, I think I remember Georgina Haynes telling me that you know they did tests right of a mechanical face for Pinocchio. Yeah. And although you might want to it to seem like wood i can i can see one perspective of it being and i think this is what she told me that if you animate wood as a mechanical face like they did with papa that can fall into a bit of an uncanny valley look because you are pushing and pulling the wood grain right yeah. in the same way that if you did a 3d model cg model all you do sometimes is bend the wood grain with blend shapes and it looks a bit weird. So it was definitely a design aesthetic and practical choice to do the 3D printed heads and then have the eye replacement and the position of the mouth replacement in a certain way. Yeah. Probably more a practical thing, Hugo. No, and no, I can, I understand. You know, I can understand why it did and didn't work. But yeah, it 
It's, and the it's interesting, isn't it? it? It just doesn't look like wood. Come on. Like, it doesn't. And here's the argument again. I'll go back to it. I'll be devil, devil advocate here. If they would have done it in CG, it would have looked like wood. <laughs> so it's just like well. they could have done the whole film with all the characters as they are in stop motion and only Pinocchio could have been in 3D. What's wrong with that? Like, I have no problems if that would have happened. And in fact, maybe we even would have won the Oscar for VFX. We would have been so amazing and so for the real and so well integrated that no one would ever know that would it was oh, a CG wood uh, uh, Pinocchio. People would all be, oh my God, this stop motion is beautiful. And then we find out that it's all CG. So I wish that would have happened. It would have been a great story, wouldn't it? <laughs> all those planes that I, oh Tom Cruise God. flew were all real. Oh, you go. Oh my God. Okay. Visual effects. Let's dive yep. into that. A really interesting thing about this film is that it was predominantly done uh, visual effects wise by Mr. X, who is, of course, now MPC. Um, and <laughs> so Mr. X has a long relationship with Del Toro on his live action films. Um, so, um, they have a great relationship. I think I was stunned myself about how many visual effects there were not surprised because as you say, you always see the animators working on blue screen or green screen. Yeah. I know from covering Leica films, they're, they're painting out, uh, stands and connectors and, you know, compositing shots. But honestly, when I um, talked to MPC, I just amazed at the work they did. And I'm going to say, I thought they did a really good job of just keeping it look kind of handcrafted, um, yep. tangible. There isn't any obvious, as you say, Hugo, CG character or CG-ness of it. Do you feel? No, no, no. It doesn't at all. Like, and, and, and to be honest, I watched the film first without watching the behind the scenes, as you should. And I really thought a lot of it more was real. Like, I'll really be mm. honest. Like, I, mm. I thought, I actually thought the water was real and all of that. And I, like, I, I mean, yeah. like stop motion, you know. I thought the explosions were real as well. I fought a lot of it. And then it turns out a lot, like, a lot of it is CG. And I, I don't think people realize this. I, I don't think so because I'm talking with people and sometimes I talk, I, I sometimes a lot of times talk with people that are not in this industry and a little bit like, like Madman Fury Road and a little bit like Top Gun, people really have an idea that this was all the Madman Mad Fury Mad Max, Road. Sorry, 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 Mad Max. <laughs> Mad Max Fury Road. Um, a, lot, a bit like Mad Max and a bit like Top Gun, people really think this was all achieved in camera. Uh, not that Netflix is not hiding it at all. Like, none of them is, are hiding. I wish there was some breakdowns, though. That would have been nice. But we can clearly see it on the behind the scenes that they're all green screen all over the place. So, And we can kind of see that sometimes the puppets are alone <laughs> by themselves and yeah. no one is next to them. So you can clearly see that they had to composite them all together. But I don't think that a lot of people realize this. But um, one thing I wanted to mention um, that really aids the visual effects on all of this, I just wanted to mention this real quick. This... As most stop motion films are done, this is photographed with a with a f photography camera, not a video camera, and this makes a huge difference because when you're shooting with a, especially the camera they use, they use the 5D, 5D Mark IV, and which is an astonishing camera, my favorite camera. Um, I have it here, actually, it's here. Like mm. this camera, my God, it's the best camera I've ever had in my life. This is the 5 DSR, uh, which is. 50 megapixels, the other one is 44. But when you're working with cameras like this, you have so much resolution. But I'm not joking, you have so much resolution. This camera, photo, the one I have here on my desk, photographs at 8,000 pixels by 6,000, okay? This is like beyond 4K, mm. beyond 6K. It is an enormous amount of resolution you have. You have so much detail, so much detail. That it is a dream to comp and something no like this. And no motion blur. Because exactly. it's stills. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. You have the photos. You have then an incredible amount of resolution from a camera. Then the optics as well, because these cameras are very good in top opticals. They use Zeiss lenses. And 
you can see that on the film. There's almost no vignetting, almost no chromatic aberration, almost nothing is going on. It's very clean and very detailed and very beautiful on the film. Then together with the motion control, which is necessary for animation. But then the cool thing about having motion control is that you can mul do multiple passes. And I've done mm. this in the past as well. It's so cool. Uh, multiple AOVs almost with the motion control. You would do with all the lights off, with only one light on, and then you would do just the background and just the silhouette and and the full clean plate, of course, as well. So you have so much power because you can have all these different passes that can hide you, uh, help you with the VFX, the exact position of the cameras. Then, of course, they went in and scanned everything. They did the 3D scan of mm. everything so they can track it because, of course, they, for you to do all the CG integration, you have to then... Rotomation, everything, so you have a real CG representation of the scene and the characters in 3D. But I want to I want to mention this to the audience because a lot of our audience are VFX v people, but not probably necessarily animation stop motion people. And the stop motion brings in a really big caveat to the, all of this because, of course, it's not 24 frames per second. It's usually less than 24 sometimes it's 12 sometimes depends on the stop motion film of course but you have this uneven in between frames that goes on in animation which creates havoc with simulations it creates havoc with cg creates all sorts of issues when you're doing interpolation motion blending all sorts of things when you're working in either compositing and cg so this is this is a really difficult technical project but also aided so much because it having motion control and there are so many vfx going on here i mean let's i guess maybe we can start anywhere but let's for example start with the rigs and the cleanup if you yeah. can and the backgrounds you know you can clearly see that there's an enormous amount of of, of rigging going on yeah. to support the puppets to support yeah. the puppets so these puppets are standing up you know and, and of course, as you say, Hugo, it has the benefit of you can basically take one frame, take the puppet out, yep. uh, get a clean plate or put a bit of green card in and get your map. You know, there's so, so, so many advantages of shooting stills as yep. stop motion with yep. also motion control, repeatable moves. I would say this as well in terms of final compositing and CG lighting is that, of course, there's a DOP on this film yeah. who has been instrumental in uh, lighting and shooting the film, with mul although there's multiple setups and stages, you know. But basically, it's lit like a real film would be lit with gels and yeah. lights yeah. and whatnot, meaning the VFX team had some very obvious final stills, plates, lighting setups to replicate. Um, they weren't making up lighting yeah, and imagery, yeah, yeah. which they often have to do on full yeah, yeah, CG yeah, shots yeah. in other films. So, yeah. Sh great, shout out to the DOP. There. Shout out to the DOP. Like, he's very experienced on this kind of productions. Like, Frank, Frank, I'm sure I'm going to butcher his name. Frank Passingan, I think that's how Yeah, passing him, I think. Yeah. Passing him, yeah. He's very, you know, very well known on this industry. He was the he director is. of photography of the Pirates. He was uh, lighting cameraman on Caroline. He, was, he worked on Flush Away. Even on Chicken Run in Close Shave as well. It was the DOP of, of, of Chicken Run as well, mm. yeah, back in the 2000s. So he's very experienced. I mean, everyone on this film, uh, the editor as well, uh, Ken uh, Scritzman, he's also very well um, um, integrated with animation. He's, he's edited Toy Story 3 and Cars and Toy Story 2 and Monster Inc. And so a lot of the people came together on this production are so experienced with animation, both in CG and, and practical. And, and stop motion, which is amazing. It's funny what you just mentioned about the, oh, we have the clean plate and it's so cool, it's so easy, and it makes it so easy. It's so fascinating to read your interview when they're talking about that the <laughs> moisture of the room would sometimes deviate mm. to the motion control set because obviously this is a wooden, like it's a set that they've built, mm. it's a real thing. And of course, it's made of wood and it's made of plastic and made of tissue and made of latex, made of a bunch of equipment materials. And when you're shooting it for months and months on end, some shots, you know, for example, the shot with the with the with the monkey going down the the, the platform, going through the circus, going mm. that was like two months to photograph. Mm. 
Mm. When you're shooting it for so long, a sequence like that, small deviations of moisture could really like move the sets and bend certain parts of the set if they're made of wood, for example, or made of organic material to a point that then they don't align <laughs> with yeah. with the passes. And of course, here comes compositing to the rescue. Then they have to tweak it and merge it. And I don't think people realize how much work there is on that side. And I know we keep saying, oh, that's not considered CG. It's not considered visual effects, but it is very much visual effects. And, and, and it has an enormous amount of aspect of cleanup. Because they had to, every time you see rods on, if you look at the behind the scene, you see these green rods everywhere. Someone has to paint them over. Even if you have a clean plate, you still have to paint them over, reveal the background. But sometimes the rods cross over the front. So then when that happens, they have to completely rebuild the puppets in the front area if the rods are crossing fronts or crossing each other. So it's, it's, it's not as easy or simple as people kind of think. And... And that added to the fact that when they are moving the puppets and animating them, then they sometimes go out of sync. And and it's quite charming to to hear your interview with the VFX soup talking about that sometimes they removed too much of and made it too perfect mm. and they mm. had to bring it back. Oh, could mm. you put back that imperfection of the head moving slightly? Yeah. So that that was a fascinating thing to try to encounter like a, a sweet spot of charm <laughs> into the into the composites I, I thought that was fascinating um on the interview and it's yeah. a really something that people usually don't talk about they don't usually say these things on the behind the scenes or on the <laughs> no. on the on the breakdowns which is nice <laughs> to hear yes so that's um aaron weintraub is the vfx soup and also we were talking about animation before we should shout out to brian leaf hansen who was the yep. animation supervisor on vfx I will say that I had an interesting experience with water. So <laughs> I didn't tell Aaron this and I'm about to say it and I don't mean it as you often say, Hugo, I don't mean any disrespect, <laughs> but again, it's the second viewing that I loved it. The first viewing was the film was not out yet on Netflix. So I thought maybe I might be seeing an unfinished cut. Oh, um, the water <laughs> The CG water, which is both ocean waves, the dogfish interaction, lapping waves on the beach, it has a very interesting look and feel. I thought in this first screening I saw, I thought maybe the water wasn't finished, the CG <laughs> water, because I thought it's a Houdini sim, it's oh got a God. certain look and feel. And of course, the second time, it's the same water. Right. And then I talked to Aaron and he said, and I asked him about the water and we said, it looks different. And he said, yep, there was lots of conversation about it. <laughs> and I actually love the way the CG water looks. It kind of sort of maybe looks like it was water done by hand somehow. Of course it wasn't. Yeah. And that's an interesting thing again about using CG tools in stop motion you don't want it to look like anything you can get out of real flow or Houdini or Maya fluids, right? You want it to look stop motiony. Yeah, so, which becomes anyway, a huge problem. Anyway, that was problem. my interesting thing. But that be that becomes a huge problem because you're trying to, um, you know, you're trying to create something that is handmade, stop motion look like. So that's the worst, right? Because CG is so perfection; it's like a simulation. So. When you do yeah. water on water, water on simulation, it looks exactly like water. But in here, you have to purposely break the system and make the system make all those little mistakes that you would have. You know, as simple as if they were doing this on water with like, you know, for example, cotton or something like that they used to do mm. on the old days. Mm. You know, just the sheer fact of someone coming into the set, opening up a little hatch, going in and moving the 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 cotton around and then closing the hatch, just that alone would move the 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 sum of it off. And sometimes you would notice that there would be seams of the cotton breaking and then others popping in. You see this in Wallace and Gromit all the time. So you have to introduce all of that to CG, which mm. is really difficult because you have to almost and main things and the entire dogfish the, the dogfish sequence the entire thing is really uh, uh, fascinating because they shot this pretty big model like this 
big, big uh, stop mm. motion uh, creature, the dogfish. And then they had to f- seamlessly integrate the CG water interacting with the actual model and that's the hardest part because they had to scan it they had to actually have a full model inside yeah you have it there yeah you have it there on the book they had to like have a cg model of it on the on, on computers so that they could actually do the water simulation and then actually have the light interaction in everything else to make it like look water there's quite a few times on this film that that happens um and on that water sequence i mean there's also a ton of full CG environments as well on this film that people yeah. people don't even realize. Plenty, probably. plenty, plenty. Yeah. Like you know, the dogfish inter- interior is a do- is a digital environment. That's why when you look at the behind the scenes, you see that a lot of times they're on green screen. Sometimes they're on black. Sometimes they're just alone. Like a lot of times, this was animated by itself without an environment, and they they put together the pieces of the characters together with the cg and together with matte painting and together with backgrounds and together with real sets so it's all kind of like a a mixed bag of techniques but but i know we're going to talk in detail but just to give to clarify to everyone the dogfish interior is digital the limbo is digital as well the entire limbo outside is digital and even some parts of the church plaza and even inside of the church some of it is digital as well and of course all the water is digital and all the sky is digital as well I don't think a lot of people realize this, um, how much, if we would have had a cut of this in just green screen, you would probably be surprised by the amount of CG that is in this film. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, and I think I think that is the nature of stop motion filmmaking yeah. because the but, design but, of the shots are grander yeah. or, you know, is it worth building a huge cyclorama background Knowing if, that you might actually have to change it anyway, yeah, um, to show different weather or locations. But don't you think when, they've missed a? Don't you think they've missed a, a, a trick here? Because this film, I was only I only knew about the VFX after the fact. After I, I read your articles and I've watched the behind mm. the scenes, I had no idea about the CG because I, I thought I was watching just like Wallace and Gromit or Fantastic Mr. Fox, like with a lot of it being real for real. Um, don't you think they missed a trick where they could potentially have this film as a nominee for VFX? I, I felt that the VFX integration was seamless. It was well, amazing to see how they've merged the characters with the CG all together. It, mm. They could have pushed more for that because I, I thought that it probably could have yeah, a chance. You know? It's an interesting question. I mean, I'm assuming it was made available to the Academy for the long lists and short list. It's an interesting question, Hugo, because one year, Kubo and the Two Strings from Leica was actually nominated for visual effects. And shout out to my good friend Steve Emerson, the visual effects supervisor on that film. And people were surprised, of course, that a stop motion film, animated film, could be nominated for visual effects. But when they saw those time lapses, yeah. um, you know, I was actually, I think in some of my articles, saying, maybe Kubo is the one that disrupts the big film that year and actually comes across and wins it. So it might be that the Academy in some ways had that experience of having a stop motion animated film as a nominee. Um, and then, you know, the, the things have moved on and we don't put Wendell and wild and we don't put yeah, Pinocchio yeah, yeah. in those yeah, lists. Yeah. Um, I don't really know the internal mechanics of it and whether also, you're right, whether Netflix pushed it. There is an argument that they didn't really push the visual effects much because you do push for a tangible, handmade look and feel to Pinocchio if you're trying to win the animation Oscar. So I'm with you. I'm with you on the like... like, This film is like handcrafted for that Oscar. I'm sorry. I, I don't mean that it's not. I'm not making it sound disingenuous. They made the film because they wanted to make the film, but it's such a perfect candidate to get an animation True. Oscar because I think that most people uh, are a bit CG out of this. You know, like there's so many yep. CG animations every year, yep. and people always remember. Oh my God, Ghibli won once. Oh my God, it was so amazing when they won the Oscar. Oh my God. And people always remember how we used to have 2D and motion, uh, stop motion on the Oscars. And every year 
it's either Pixar or DreamWorks or Pixar or DreamWorks. It's always every year CG, 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 CG. Obviously, we were surprised last year. I think it was last year or two years ago with Spider Man, which was a different approach. And I think we're mm-hmm. now turning, giving that it's it's there's a turning point going on here. No disrespect to the other nominees. The other nominees look great. You know, Red looked amazing. Every other nominee looked amazing on animation. But the, this was special. This was different. And I think that's why it won. I think it was... I'm sure it was a landslide vote because it looked so different. And yeah, I'll, I'll even argue that if there were four other stop-motion animation, probably it wouldn't have won. And I feel that it just... It really took the Oscar in because it was in stop animation, and I' not saying that they that they did it in purpose. Of course, they didn't, but it really it it helped. I think it helped the whole package. I I feel like it it's it's a bit perfect for for especially now we are living a phase where you know practical and people hate CG and there's like this entire world of of twitter and social media trying to back uh the things that are done for real so i think it was the perfect timing for Mm. this film to be released absolutely perfect timing i think we were spoiled this year hugo with you know a really great selection of animated films and of course marcel the shell was stop motion animated as well um sorry i forgot about that (laughs) but the other ones Sea Beast and Puss in Boots and Turning Red, they do have a slightly stylized feel, some of those, yeah. which is maybe moving away from the yeah, classic yeah. Pixar DreamWorks. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, stop, uh, CG look and feel. So, I, And there is that stylization, stylization thing happening, NPR rendering yeah. thing happening in animated films. But you're right, the handcraftedness also del toro come on yeah he won the other oscar already yeah he already won the oscar you know they really pushed hard on him and he's been Um, he's been very much alive on everyone's mind he was even he was even involved in that stranding a really famous game a couple of years ago he was actually an actor on that film and and he he then won the oscar as well a few years back as well so he's been Mm -hmm. very very involved i i know i know what you mean he's He's, he's a beloved uh, director that has made some amazing films, um, you know. So I, I feel like if Pinocchio wasn't here, maybe I think Puss in Boots would have won because Puss in Boots has this really different look. It's mm. really beautiful and it's really different from everything else. And I actually thought it was going to win Puss in Boots, really, like, to be honest. Oh, but, really? But I, I thought I think, it was going to be Marcel. You think it was Marcel? Year. Okay, well. Just okay. for the cute factor. But I, I feel like, <laughs> I, I know what you mean. Guillermo del Toro has made um, some amazing movies, some not so amazing movies as well. I mean, he is also the director of Blade 2, which is not that good in Mimic as well. But, but I mean, what? He, <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Blade 2 is okay. It's fine. But I love Blade 1. I think it's okay. But of course, you know, Pan's Labyrinth and Devil's Backbone. And of course, my favorite, Pacific Rim. <laughs> Pacific Rim is just mind blowing. And it's a Don't really. You hassle Pacific Rim. No, Hugo. Pacific Rim, the first one, not the second one. The second one is shit. But the first one, yeah, I think it's an, an, an underrated masterpiece. It is an amazing movie that people I think it's a do masterpiece. not. They do not give it enough love. And I feel. The film is stunning, and still to this day, it's so old now, still to this day, the visual effects, which are now 10 years old, they are absolutely mm. stunning. Like, I, yeah. I just watched it the other day. It looks yeah. just as good as any other production coming yeah. out now. Thank maybe you, even, Maybe even better than some things that and, came out. And you know? isn't it going to be great when Del Toro directs Neon Genesis Evangelion? Oh, yeah. I mean... Yeah. Damn. Come on. He's the perfect director for that. I know. I know exactly <laughs> what you mean. Uh, but yeah, no, All right. I, 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 he's had some ups and downs. I, I'm not so fond of Shape of Water. I haven't watched Nightmare Holly, uh, Hallway uh, uh, yet. I haven't watched that yet. But no, he's, he's an amazing director. And I, yeah, man, everyone needs to go and watch the behind the scenes because you learn so much by watching the behind the scenes of Pinocchio. You do. Like, it's it's... It's really interesting yeah. to see it. If only there was a magazine that had in-depth <laughs> coverage of it as well. I mean, yeah, amazing. All right, Hugo, let's wrap this up. It's been really interesting <laughs> getting your perspective on the film and making me think about it as well. I'm sorry. Um, I'd love to hear what everyone out there thinks about the film. 
not just about the behind the scenes and the technical artistry, but the actual film itself. Um, please chime in on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, wherever. Thank you, Hugo, for going through that with me. It's been really fun chatting about Pinocchio. Yeah, it's been great as well. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.